After the race to send the first satellite into space, followed by the first living being, the space competition between the United States and the Soviet Union shifts its focus to sending the first human into space. Today, we dive into the Mercury program and its seven astronauts. We are at the end of the year 1957. With the Soviet Union's launch of Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth, the space race is underway. The Soviets then send the first living being into Earth's orbit, the dog Laika. The year 1958 marks the beginning of the American response. In February, the NACA the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics is tasked with sending the first American satellite into orbit, Explorer 1. But to catch up with the Soviets, much more will be needed. Human spaceflight is the next step for both sides, and for that, the United States will need a launch vehicle, a capsule, and pilots. In July 1958, the NACA became NASA. The American Human Spaceflight Program was named Project Mercury, and while pilot sections were about to begin, engineers were working on the capsule. These engineers were part of the NASA's Space Task Group, or STG, whose sole and primary objective was to make human spaceflight possible. The Space Task Group had four objectives selecting and training potential future pilots, creating a technical specification for spaceflight and finding capable companies to fulfill it, designing a viable launch vehicle, and creating a system of tracking antennas to monitor a flight around the globe. Several divisions were established, such as mission control and public affairs. In the flight system division, Maxim Faget was at the helm. Although his name may sound French, his family had origins in Louisiana. He was the son and grandson of two great doctors, Jean-Charles Faget and Guy Faget, both of whom made significant contributions to the diagnosis and treatment of yellow fever and leprosy. However, Maxime was passionate about aeronautics, so he pursued a career as an engineer. After completing his studies, he was hired at the NACA Langley Aeronautical Research Center, which later became one of the original NASA field centers. There, he worked specifically on aerodynamic means to break the sound barrier. Since they didn't have large wind tunnels, he and his colleagues came up with the idea of testing their creations using scale models. Climbing through the ranks, he was tasked with the aero aspect of a division responsible for developing uncrewed aircraft. His talent then led him to design the external structure of the Mercury capsule, but most importantly, its rescue tower, a backup system that would later be adopted for the majority of human spacecraft, except for Project Gemini and the Space Shuttle. For the design of the capsule, the Space Task Group issued a request for proposal at the end of 1958 and contacted 40 potential companies. Among them, 18 expressed interest and, ultimately, only 11 submitted offers, including Lockheed, North American, McDonnell and Northrop. McDonnell was chosen, surpassing the expectation of the technical specification. However, Faget's and McDonald's teams had to address two unknowns in their plan. Designing an escape system in case of problems during launch and finding the best way to withstand the heat of re-entry. Initially, McDonald proposed NASA a rescue system based on three solid rocket motors housed at the base of the capsule, which, in case of malfunction, would propel the capsule away from the booster. But this system, although effective, would reduce the booster's performance and could even pose aerodynamic issues. 
Faget's team proposed a different solution, an escape tower placed atop the capsule, also equipped with rockets. This alternative was heavier, but more suitable in terms of flight performance. It was during this time that NASA invented the concept of the escape tower. Regarding thermal protection during re-entry, after numerous tests and different materials, a combination of aluminium and fiberglass was chosen. This composite could dissipate the more than 1000 degrees Celsius experienced during the return to Earth. However, this capsule required a powerful rocket, so attention turned to the missiles in the American arsenal. German engineers, including Werner von Braun, were acquired by the American and brought to the United States after World War II. They were responsible for the first rocket to reach space, although its original purpose was different, the German V-2 missile. After the war, it was only natural for the United States to welcome them and have them work on even more advanced missiles. The team settled in the city of Redstone, Alabama. They worked on a ballistic missile capable of hitting a target between 240 and 800 kilometers away with a payload of 680 to 1360 kg. It was from this missile, named Redstone, which made its first test flight in 1953, that the first rocket to send an American into space would emerge. However, it was not capable of achieving orbit. NASA's goal was to have its seven future pilots each perform a suborbital flight, meaning a flight into space that would quickly descend without entering orbit. The flight was expected to last about 15 minutes, with approximately 5 minutes of weightlessness. Following these seven suborbital flights, the pilots would be assigned to Earth orbiting missions using a more powerful rocket, the ATLAS. In 1953, alongside the German work on the Redstone missile, the military commissioned Convair to develop a much more powerful intercontinental missile with a range of 10,000 kilometers to rival the Soviet Air 7 missile. It was named Atlas and its first flight took place in 1957. But... And the next one didn't go any better. But in the end, the concept ended up working and on December 18, 1958, an Atlas B successfully placed the Project SCORE satellite into orbit, which had a single mission. Les paroles du président furent transmises du sol au satellite qui, sur un signal, les retransmit ensuite à la Terre. À la Maison Blanche, des journalistes du monde entier se trouvent avec le président Eisenhower pour écouter la voix de ce dernier, retransmise par le satellite tournant dans l'espace. This is the President of the United States speaking. Through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. My message is a simple one. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on Earth and goodwill toward men everywhere. It was an ideological response to the launches of Sputnik 1 and 2, allowing United States to demonstrate to the world that they could compete with the Soviets in the space race. After a qualification phase, the Atlas launcher, like the Redstone, was selected to perform future orbital flights to the Mercury program. Now, it was time to select the astronauts. A major press campaign amplified NASA's call for candidates. Out of 508 profiles, 110 individuals were selected based on the following criteria. Being under 40 years old, measuring less than 1.8 meters in height, holding an engineering or science degree, accumulating at least 1,500 flight hours, having completed a military test pilot program and, of course, being in excellent physical and mental condition. 
Some prominent figures of the time, or those who would become prominent, were unable to apply. Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier in 1947, didn't have a degree, and Neil Armstrong, as a civilian, was ineligible. As for women, none were test pilots at the time. After an interview, the volunteer candidates underwent extremely demanding tests. From 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. for over a week, these men underwent 17 ocular tests and provided 30 blood, urine, and tissue samples. From their heart rates to their brain signals, their entire bodies were subjected to intense stress while being closely monitored. Their reflexes and stress levels were also measured. They were placed in rooms, heated to 54 degrees Celsius for two hours, spent three hours in a completely dark isolation chamber, experienced 9G forces in a centrifuge while reacting to sounds, were subjected to a strongly shaken cabin, and even immersed their feet in ice water while exposed to high altitude pressure in a chamber with minimal protection. Despite the grueling and sometimes torturous test, none of them gave up. Only Jim Lovell had to withdraw due to a liver problem. After this test, only 31 of them remained. They were then subjected to psychological tests of 25 different types, including the famous Rochard test. They were asked to elaborate on images, respond to questionnaire consisting of 566 self-related questions, and engage in a sort of card game where candidates had to choose among various statements about themselves. After all these tests, which lasted about two weeks, the pilots were sent back to their original units while awaiting the results. 13 were eliminated, leaving the 18 remaining. After a second round, 11 out of the 18 were also eliminated. The remaining 7 were chosen and became the first group of NASA astronauts. Just one week after the final selection, the press is invited to NASA headquarters in Washington to meet the faces of these seven future astronauts. They are seated alphabetically behind a table facing the journalists. Their names are Michael Scott Carpenter, lieutenant in the US Navy, Leroy Gordon Cooper, captain in the US Air Force, John Herschel Glenn, lieutenant colonel in the US Marine Corps, Virgil Ivan Grissom, Captain in the US Air Force, Walter Marty Shira, Lieutenant Commander in the US Navy, Alan Bartlett Shepard, Lieutenant Commander in the US Navy, and Donald Kent Slayton, Captain in the US Air Force. But the most eye-catching among them, with remarkable patriotic and inspiring answers, is John Glenn. Experienced in public relations, he masterfully understands communication techniques and will contribute to building the image of the perfect American man devoted to his beliefs and close to his family. From that way forward, these seven astronauts, still far from their first spaceflight, will become beloved public figures. The astronauts actively participate in the development of the Mercury capsule. They regularly visit the NASA subcontractors' factories, initially to assist in the development process, but primarily for public relations purposes. NASA believes that through this involvement, the engineers will be motivated to deliver a capsule and systems that are top-notch. In September 1958, they request three significant modifications. First, they want manual controls instead of automatic controls. They want the ability to regain manual control in case of system malfunction. And, of course, to achieve this, they request the installation of a window to be able to see the outside, especially the star and the Earth, for proper orientation. The third request is for an explosive bolt system that would allow them to eject the hatch and quickly evacuate the capsule in case of an emergency on Earth. 
The engineers resist these demands, citing, among other things, that no human would be capable of piloting a vehicle at such speed. But after months of negotiations, they eventually concede and the capsule receives the modification requested by the astronauts. In addition to this, the astronauts also undergo training in space science. The program includes courses in aerodynamics, guidance, space navigation, physics and even medicine. Each astronaut also specializes in one aspect of the program. Carpenter becomes an expert in communications and navigation, Cooper focuses on the redstone, Glenn on the capsule cockpit, Grissom on manual and automatic control systems, Shira on life support and pressurized suits, Shepard on flight tracking and recovery, and finally, Slayton specializes in the Atlas rocket. They also spend about 30 hours studying the sky at the Chapel Hill Planetarium to help them orient themselves in case of manual control in space. Naturally, they continue their physical training with various simulators, centrifuge and zero-gravity flight techniques. To train for capsule control, they use the Mastiff, a multi-axis simulator that puts the astronauts in a simulated space spin that they must stop using their joysticks. They also undergo training in emergency capsule evacuation, including being submerged in a water tank. Finally, they participate in a survival course in the Nevada desert. The training consists of one and a half days of instruction, one day of orienteering with their basic equipment, and a three-day survival exercise to validate the course. By the end of 1959, the four smoking astronauts in the group had quit smoking and were eagerly awaiting their first flight. The lives of the Mercury 7 are quite enjoyable. When they are in Florida, they stay at the Holiday Inn in Cocoa Beach. In town, women begin to boast about having slept with six out of the seven astronauts. A local car dealer offers them Corvette Stingrays and they spend long days racing on Florida's long straight roads. They also play numerous jokes, such as the Turtle Club joke, which was well known in the military at the time. It involves asking someone, are you a turtle? And the other person has to respond, you bet you're sweet as I am. Although it doesn't make much sense in itself, the response is not very appropriate at cocktail parties and official events. Leo Diorsi, a famous celebrity lawyer, negotiates an exclusive contract with Life magazine for the stories of each astronaut. In return, the Mercury 7 will share $500,000. The magazine builds an image of them as good family men, American heroes with pure morals and strong faith in God. Obviously, except perhaps for John Glenn, the distance from their families and their daredevil personalities make them less faithful to their wives. Their seven families appear united in public, but several of them are broken in private, although divorce or separation is not publicly acceptable. Leo Diorsi represents them until his death in 1963, making some of them millionaires thanks to his astute financial advice. The contrast with the Soviet space program is at its peak. On the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Russians keep everything secret. Sergei Korolev, in charge of the rocket design, remains anonymous. As for the astronauts, their identities are top secret and their comfort is relatively unknown. While the training continues and the first American spaceflight approaches, tests of the capsule under real conditions will begin. In the coming years, the first mission control will be established, the first American animals will go to space, and everything that will determine, through successes to failures, whether the Americans or the Soviets, will be the first to send a human into space.
I hope you enjoyed this first episode on the genesis of the Project Mercury. If that's the case, feel free to show your appreciation with a thumbs up or a small donation on Patreon or Ko-fi. Thanks to those who are supporting the channel. As for us, we'll see you next time for a new episode of Stardust. See ya!